I'm curious if uh, you might have... Um, first of all, I didn't understand what your notion of median was in the multidimensional world, and I'd like to know what it is in your, in your concept. Uh, so why was that upper right-hand corner the median as opposed to something else? Um, secondly, uh, it seems that in many cases you do have three um, observations. A recent paper with Indranil Dutta uh, was that case, in fact, using GSS uh, survey data on life satisfaction, happiness, uh, where we got some really nice, you know, uses of the same methodology, but with three, and it's really quite interesting for the single dimension case, and I hadn't thought about multidimensional in that. I'd like to hear if you've thought about multidimension to the next case of three as opposed to two. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Maybe should I answer this first, or should I, should I click? Okay, so um, let me just uh, illustrate um, the, the median concept again. Sorry. Um, so uh, the, the multidimensional median here is uh, is the uh, is simply the, uh, the the tuple or the, the vector of the uh, medians of the partial uh, marginals. So here in this case. We have uh, the marginals here, it's free. they are free here, and there are seven healthy. So it means that, and here, there are six poor, and there are uh, four rich. So it's, it's the, simply the, the median along each dimension that we combine into the multidimensional uh, median. And it's known, and it, it's, it has been uh, argued in uh, mathematics literature that that is the only... Uh, uh, natural uh, multidimensional median concept uh, for ordinal uh, data. Um, and then as to your, to, to your second question, uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned some uh, examples with uh, free, uh, free levels. Yeah, in the review of income and wealth. Yeah. I mean, uh, so strictly speaking, our, our, our procedure that, that we provide in the paper, it only applies to uh, two by two cases with, with two binary uh, um, indicators. If you have, like, if you have uh, uh, two dimensions with three levels, then it should also be possible to, 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 to work out a, a checking procedure. Um, However, it, it, it would be more, um, it would be more uh, complicated, uh, but, but should be, be, be able to, 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 to do it. What we want to look for is, is a completed general checking procedure that applies to, uh, to general bivariate uh, data. And there, you would need another approach than we, we take in this, uh, this, this paper here. But for those very small, uh, uh, small cases like 2 by 2 or 3 by 3 it should be possible to to work out uh, uh, some ad hoc, uh, in ad hoc work out some checking procedures that, that, that work. Okay, any other question? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Very interesting presentation. Um, quick observation that um, when you do bivariate case, Okay, it's intuitive. When you go to three-dimensional case, it becomes a bit difficult. And as you move on, um, it, of course, becomes much more critical. So, of course, you will analyze that. What this particular framework can tell you, whether inequality is higher or lower in terms of dominance, and when you do not have first-order dominance holds, then you cannot conclude anything. And that's the most difficult thing when it comes to applicability, whether you talk about Duclosan and Younger or Bugni and Chakraborty, all this world. So it may be interesting to develop, um, as I, uh, along with Professor Foster, has tried to develop sort of an idea of robustness. So you know if your dominance holds, fine, you know one group has higher inequality than the other. What happens when dominance does not hold? Can you say to what extent you can make the comparison, whether it is not at all possible or to what extent, what kind of, you know? So it's sort of a robustness idea that comes underneath of dominance. Maybe you can think about it, it's just a comment. But it's a very valid uh, comment because in indeed also in this application, it, uh, in many of the cases, we don't have any uh, uh, relations. We don't have first order dominance, we don't have inequality, uh, this quality dominance. Um, 
what we can do, uh, um, so essentially that is a part of the, 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 the concept. It's, we, I mean, it's, the idea is to make a robust uh, concept and then hence it has to be demanding in a sense. However, uh, one possible uh, uh, approach could be to make, uh, uh, since these are, this is sample data, uh, to make uh, bootstrap replications of the data and then uh, make the uh, comparisons again and again with the bootstrap uh, uh, resampled data. And actually, this is what we, we, we do in, uh, in this paper. Uh, when we have uh, a dominance, observed a dominance, uh, we, we bootstrap the data, resample the data, and then uh, check how many, how many times out of a thousand, say, we actually get the uh, uh, dominance relation again. So that's, a sense, an indication of the sort of statistical robustness of the, uh, uh, the, uh, of the, um, um, of, of the dominance relation. You could also do it if you don't have dominance. We could uh, resample the data and then check if, uh, at least in some cases, we, we actually get the dominance. That would be an indicator that we would be close to dominance in some, some, in some sense. Yeah. So that's one, one way to, 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 to address this. Uh, uh, taking a bootstrap uh, uh, approach. Any other question? Okay, if not, then thank you. I have two questions. Um, one is the weights. Uh, you have, uh, you said you're not explaining how the weights were calculated, but nevertheless, I'm just asking whether the weights are subjective or is there a method for it? Secondly, are they different for different countries? And the other question is that, uh, especially for India, we know that uh, if you're calculating the uh, index from the DHS and only mix, then DHS is uh, last was, it was done in 2006. And so I wonder why the uh, numbers of destitute has increased when uh, the nutrition data hasn't changed and if you're giving higher weight to nutrition, I'm presuming, because it was the top. So, um, I because you know, if your schooling data is of 2010 or 11, nutrition data is of 2006. So, do you make any adjustments for all that? Thanks. May I answer one by one? No, it's let's easier. collect questions and then we will get back to them. So, there was another question in the back. Yes, I, I like this idea of. Uh, looking at more information, more variables. But I wonder, how do you really know you are identifying the poor or the destitute? Uh, is there an external validation of this? Uh, or, or you are just providing another index, and then with this index, you have another criteria to, to, to classify people in one category or the other? Because I don't see any external validation uh, of this index or any other index uh, that uses many dimensions or whatever. Thank you. James, you also had a question or? Yeah, no, yeah. So you're talking about destitute versus poor. The poor definition is already pretty acute. And I was wondering if there was any theoretical or, in fact, any other intuition that you could be providing us as to why you would choose the particular cutoff levels that were chosen in defining the destitute. Is there a conceptual framework that guided you in doing that, or was that sort of just based on what cutoffs were available in the data and you had to go with what you had? Um, that was one question. I'm wondering if there's another one. Yeah, the second one was the conceptual trade-off between changing depth and changing breadth. Can you offer any insight as to what that does when using a measure of this type, which is based on breadth, but nonetheless, you're changing depth, and the trade-off between those two could be quite interesting as to who is captured in one case versus another. Thank you. Thank you. So, though... Please go ahead. What? Okay. Okay, so the first question on weights. So when this index was constructed, this is an international index. And of course, it has gone through various drafts, you know, to understand um, how the weights, weights are same across all countries. They are not different. 
okay? And given that your two questions are related, let me just tell you how the multidimensional poverty index is different from the idea of composite indices. In compo, as you said, for schooling, you have recent data, for health, we have old data. So you are thinking in terms of the human poverty index or human development index where you have index for each dimension and you add them up. This is not how the MPI is computed. The, for MPI, all data has to be available from one source so that for each household, you are able to see the multiple deprivations and then identify the household accordingly and then you aggregate across the household. So that is the first thing. I think it answers also your partial, uh, the second question. So all data for India came from 2005-06 DHS data set. Destitution increased or not, I have not presented in this one, but destitution has gone down in India when we analyzed between 1999 and 2006. In fact, in the Indian context, reduction in destitution was much faster than the reduction of MPI. So that's a positive story, and that is what we presented in um, uh, the 2013 paper with, with Sabine Alkai. Subjective weight or different weight? Weights were chosen in a way, finally, to represent sort of the idea of the human development index where all three dimensions were weighted equally. Here also we have three pillars, standard of living, education, and health. And as Professor Tony Atkinson argues that in this kind of situations where you really do not know how to decide, choose the dimensions in such a way that they have like equal importance. So that was that one factor that, that played behind this. So dimensions were chosen with sort of equal importance as was done in the HDI. And then indicators within each dimensions, they were just equally weighted. Okay? So that's, I hope that answers your questions. Um, how do we do validation? What we have done in the past, since 2010, that we have tried to implement these indicators um, to fields. So we would go and talk to people on ground and also collect information if they are really, and we try to put those stories um, in our policy brief, policy research, research briefs. And yes, yeah, so they are vali validated, and it has been found that some people whose conditions, whether they are really, really deprived. For destitution, we haven't done it yet, because for destitution, this is just the concept here. What we tried to do, we tried, to, given that the MPA poor suffer in, the, in those dimensions, and we have validated that, we tried to understand what if we put further threshold, further put it deeper down, whether or how many people do we identify. But I completely agree with you, this requires going to, uh, this requires validation, going to field. We haven't, for destitution, we have not done that but I take your point, it should be done. Um, Professor Foster's uh, questions. Particular cutoff level and conceptual cutoffs. So for depth approach, of course, it was driven by both because electricity, for example, is a prime example where we wanted to know whether access, yes or no, is not enough. I have been raised in a family where I had 10 hour power cut. I enjoyed the time. I didn't have to study or whatever. I had fun time. But that were, that were deprivations. Of course, I did not do my education properly. So just having access to electricity is not enough. And we wanted to, and when we have worked with different country national governments, we have tried to select cutoffs based on Iraq, for example, when we were working with the Iraqi government and UNDP over there, we tried to select the cutoff that at least um, 12 hours of electricity has to be there which we, we could not do here. We are working on an urban slum, pro slum project where we find that the, the household has access to water, but it's between 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning. That is the only time you have access to water, whether that is sufficient, whether that is enough. So those are the things that we cannot address from the data because simply in the data we do not have, have things. So, so we said the deeper cutoff, but at some places where it, we can get the maximum possible. For example, sanitation, another example, open defecation. That's the m minimum possible thing we, we got, and it's a huge bunch of people. We could not go beyond that. So by part, yes, it was affected. Okay, Universalization of primary education. So that actually motivated the uh, MPI cutoff. And then we, 
wind to a deeper cutoff where we try to say and uh, try to be you know as much uh, uh, how should I say um, we could debate so we we try to be less controversial. So for education, we said if no child in that household is attending school, then the child is identified. So probably it gives you a legitimate cutoff. So those kind of mix of conceptualizations and, and um, availability of data, what we had, played the role in defining, defining the cutoff. Um, Trade-off. So for the Indian context, as I was telling, what we did, we implemented the cut off, say, uh, instead of 33%, we used 50%, the United Nations definition of identifying severe poverty. And then we have the set of deeper cut off, but keeping KSM, this poverty cut off same. And we tried to understand the interplay, whether we are identifying the same number of people. We did not. So out of the 56% of the population in 1999, we identified nearly 24% as deprived in both. And there were people in the other two segments, as in the previous section was pre presented, when you, when you look at the marginal distributions, there were people, they were mismatch. So those were the trade-off, and trade-off's high. It does not identify the same group of people, honestly. So, so that is what I can tell you at this moment. Empirically, we have not tried to compute any index sort of that gives you, you know, the amount of trade-off, but this is where we stand at this moment. Okay, thank you very much. Then we have to move to the third presentation. Perfect, Thanks again. makes sense. Thank you so much. Hi, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, I didn't follow everything because it was presented a bit quickly, so I'm not entirely sure what you're measuring in, in the inequality section, but uh, I just wanted to ask you a question, whether you had thought of, and I'm not sure if you can do this without having pure dyads, but if you had thought of um, using something like the gender parity index uh, to look within households. Suppose you had households with just one boy and one girl, mm -hmm. so make it simple. Uh, what the gender parity index does is it takes whoever is higher and uses that person's as the poverty cutoff, if you will, and then uses a poverty gap mm. to measure <laughs> the shortfall from that of the other persons. And then you just divide up. You first have a head count, yeah. right, of the percentage of people who were girls or above boys and percentage of boys. But now you can go into a gap, which measures, well, if so, then how far are they percentage-wise from, uh, from the person with the higher of the two? So it would be natural to explore not just percentages, but to look at uh, how big the gap is. And I'm reminded of this because if you look at uh, Rwanda, for instance, it's educational gap between men and women in married pairs, in this case, is, uh, is virtually nothing. It's a half a year. But if you subdivide it to those where women have higher education or the spouse that's male has a higher education, in both directions it's three years on average. And so, and it's fi about 50, you know, equal share in both of those cases, it turns out. And the women with the more in the urban area and the men with more in the rural areas, but you're hiding all the interesting disparities if you look at the average, and that's what you're pointing out. I'm just saying there might be another way of pointing it out by means of the gender parity index of the Women's Empowerment Agriculture Index, which, of course, was put together by Sabina and, and myself and a bunch of other people, so... Thank you. Um, please tell us which of the indicated uh, level of uh, chronic undernutrition you're using, minus two or minus three Z scores. Uh, second question, um, remind us the uh, MICS definition of household. Is it based on residence or is it based on kinship? If the former, one would be much less surprised at the extent of disparity. Um, if it's based on kinship, one would expect to find um, much lower levels of, of disparity. Okay, we take a second question here in the back. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Hisao Katsu, I'm a disability researcher, and this comment is actually for all of the three presenters. Um, if you uh, rely your data on the existing uh, ones, that means that many of the children who are socially uh, marginalized are not necessarily included into those. 
and particularly so for children with disabilities. And I would like to pose a question to all of you, whether you have ever thought of uh, relying on the existing data only, and by that, perhaps you might be reinforcing the fact that the inequalities are continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question? Okay, if not, yes, please. Uh, mine is quick. Uh, one of the indicators, <coughs> birth registration. I couldn't understand how it's going to be like capturing what you want for inequality between boys and I couldn't understand really. Whether it's, I doubt whether it is even a very good indicator sometimes to, for intra household inequality. I don't know. I just want clarification. Okay, thank you. And maybe you start, and because the question before was also to the other presenters, then I just hand over to the two previous presenters in case you want to respond something. Okay. Um, so first one, the gender uh, parity index. I, I think it's it's a good one. Um, it's it, I think it would be possible. Um, the one thing is that for some indicators um, that they're binary, how would that work? How the gap would yeah, work? Um, so, so, but yeah, I haven't thought of that, but yeah, it, it, I think it would be uh, a good way to do it. Um, this, the, the way I do it only captures whether girls or boys in households are more or, or less advantaged, and, and also, it, I guess it obscures whether there could be differences also across girls or across boys, and this assumes that well, all girls within a household have a similar value and all boys within a household have a similar value, and there, there are other differences that could be due to age, for example, birth order, um, and that's not captured here. This, is, this only captures uh, gender differences. So, so that's, that's important to take into account. Uh, the second, um, under nutrition, uh, minus two standard deviations. And I should mention that although I know there is a newer reference from the WHO, I use the old one because um, most of the mixed service from pre previous rounds only have the old um, standards for nutrition. So for, for comparing across uh, different periods, I use the old ones, but it's, it's not the best. The new standards are, are much better, and, and newer rounds have that new standard, but older rounds of, of the service don't. Um, and about the household definition, I believe it's on residence, um, but I need to double check with the, with the mixed service, but yes. Um, I'll go on the birth registration and then finish with the, with the overall question. Birth registration is, um, is whether a child is registered at birth. And that may not seem highly relevant, but it actually is. Because birth registration um, gives access to services, gives access um, to many things for children. It's part of the right to have a nationality, for example. It gives right to vote when, when children grow up. So it, it is actually a very important indicator of child well-being. And, and I, I think one of the main things I wanted to do with this is to show a wider range of indicators for child well-being. As I said, the, the Convention of Rights of Child has 17. These are only four. So there are many other things that are not included here, but I think birth registration is a, is a very important one. And the final one on um, using ex existing data only. Um, yes, I think it, it, it could um, reinforce inequalities because we're not, we're not looking at, at other things. And um, one of the things I, I just said is that, for example, I would have liked to look at many other dimensions of child well-being, but I only have four. Um, so I, I work with that, and hopefully um, new service which have more information could be used. You could apply this same methodology. If, if you were looking at one specific country, for example, you could look at other sources of data. Uh, I'm using this international comparable uh, source, which is the mixed service. Uh, but if you would want to focus on other things, you, in some countries you could go and, and find other surveys. In terms of uh, disability, I think the WHO has uh, a new module on um, disability to including household service. And I, I think it's a pilot, but if, for example, that was included in standard household service, that would be very useful to have a sense of, of other inequalities, um, not only for children, but uh, for other groups as well. I'll leave it to the other um, panelists. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to respond something to this general question?
So yes, um, on data issues, yes, it's a it's a valid concern that we work with uh, the, the the existing data sets that we have at this moment. But you also have to keep in mind that the, it depends on the objective of the study. So here, the objective of our study at this moment was to um, make international comparisons based on what we have. And unfortunately, we don't have the resources to go and collect the data by ourselves. What we can do, we compute and we can try to influence those who are collecting the data to include those further things. Uh, honestly, in India, in the Indian context, I know the um, the pavement dwellers. They are not included in the service because this is only household survey. So we have no way of of uh, understanding their situation. So these household surveys are meant to be nationally representative because you cannot collect a massively large sample it has to be restricted by budget. But uh, the coverages can only improve over time. And even if we want to go and try to collect, probably we'll be able to collect data on those particular people, but maybe not the others. So it's a complex problem, but I completely take your point that there is need to go beyond what we have at this moment, collect information on more dimensions, as well as uh, more people to understand and the data reflect the reality. Last Peter, anything you would like to add? Or? No. Okay, then we are at the end. Thanks again to the presenters. Thanks for coming to this session. Two further announcements. First, the uh, lunch is downstairs. And then if you're interested to connect a notebook or a smartphone or whatever to the Internet, I received these instructions, and I think it would take uh, this one, sorry, too much time to explain it to you. So I just leave it here, and you can come to the desk and then check it out. Thank you.